Hey everybody and welcome back to Jim's Garage. Unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably seen the trillion dollar problem. I'm talking about DeepSeek R1. And in this video, I'm gonna be discussing what it is and we're also gonna be setting it up. We're gonna be setting it up in Docker, which you can use in Linux and in Windows Docker for desktop. And I'll also show the simplest way to set this up in Windows. The benefit of that is you can play, you can learn, and you can do it all safe in the knowledge that your data remains private. So if you wanna skip ahead to deployment, use the chapters below. We're gonna have a quick primer on what DeepSeek is and why this is a problem. So on Monday, you probably saw the stock markets collapse or at least the bubble popping around AI. It has recovered somewhat since then, but the long and short of it was about a trillion dollars was taken off some of the top tech companies. We're talking about 500 billion from Nvidia and multiple hundreds of billions between Facebook and Microsoft respectively, who obviously have a 50% share in OpenAI. Now the key reason for that was because this unknown party from China basically set up a new large language model called DeepSeek purportedly for as little as $6 million. You compare that to what's happening in the West, whereby they're burning hundreds of billions of dollars to stand this up. Not only that, DeepSeek is open source, which as a home labber, we all love, right? But also the operational costs as well. So whilst Nvidia have been getting fat on lots of GPU sales for AI acceleration, the actual hardware requirements, because of the way that the model is constructed, is much more reduced. That means that if that became the dominant model, there'd likely be less demand for GPUs. A great thing for us consumers and you gamers out there, you can finally get that GPU. But if you're thinking about a business in terms of spinning up a data center with hundreds or thousands of GPUs, look at Elon Musk and Grok, for example, that's gonna reduce your capital expenditure significantly. So what is DeepSeek and how is it different? I'm going to scratch the surface on that as I could spend a whole hour discussing what the differences and nuances are. But effectively, DeepSeek is different in the way that it operates. It tries to emulate the thought process. And you'll see from examples later on, when you ask it a question, you can actually see the thought processes. It will give you an estimation of what it thinks the question you are asking is. It will then try and break down sort of the clauses within that sentence or question. And it will then show you the thought process of how it starts to build an answer. Now, it's not always right but it's pretty good and from the benchmarking i've seen it's right up there if not better than some of the existing models and it's free that causes a real problem and it's great to see this level of disruption in the market something that's traditionally been dominated by just a few players now there are concerns around bias and yeah if you ask it about the events of a certain square in 1989 it gets a little bit touchy but if you stick at it i did manage to get a response and yeah, there's definitely some bias in there. Now that could be a problem and that could put you off. It depends what you're gonna be using this for. If you're using it for more say software or just abstract questions, problem solving, that bias likely isn't gonna cause a problem. But again, I haven't done extensive testing in that and time will tell just how bad it is. That's not to say that there's probably some Western bias in the existing models if you look for it. Also, it's worth noting that with any model, there are lots of configuration parameters. What we're gonna set up today is gonna to give you the flexibility to choose what's right for your hardware. So for example, you've probably seen the B notation at the end of LLMs. Now that refers to billions of parameters. Basically more parameters, greater accuracy. But that does come at a significant trade-off. The more parameters you have, the more hardware you need. Specifically things like VRAM and actual RAM, plus even CPU processing power. Now, the way I'm gonna set this up is just simply using a CPU in the Docker environment, but then a GPU on my Windows desktop, which I'm recording this video on. I will give you the configuration files where you can choose. You can simply swap in a GPU and swap it out if you have one. I don't have an Nvidia card on my server, but it should be pretty trivial to get that up and running. Obviously with GPUs and part of the reason Nvidia's stock price has exploded is because it accelerates AI workloads. Now, you don't need it as I've mentioned, and I'll be demonstrating that later in the video. So let's hop on over quickly and let's get this stood up. We're gonna do the Docker installation first, and then we'll move on to Windows at the end. Don't sweat it, this is really straightforward, and I'll give you a full breakdown of what exactly we're doing. To get this up and running, we're gonna be using Olama with the Olama web UI. I've covered this before, but the reason I choose this is it makes life so much simpler. 
Olama is basically a model engine that you can plug lots of different LLMs into. So you can use this not only to run DeepSeek, but also anything else that you want, things like Mistral, Llama, etc. The web UI as well is optional in this stack and you can remove it if you don't want to. You can then access it obviously via the CLI, but I think the web UI makes life easier. And if you're watching this for the first time and you just want to get stuck in, I recommend you keep it. We can also use this Docker stack to open up the Olama API. And in my previous video using Open Hands, we can plug that into Olama. So effectively you could have Open Hands running DeepSeek, which is pretty cool. So having a quick look through what this container stack involves, at the top we've got Olama. This is the thing that's going to be running the LLM itself. And as I mentioned, if you have a GPU, you can uncomment this section here. This will add NVIDIA GPU support to your stack. Now, obviously, if you need GPU pass-through on a virtual machine, etc., go and check out some of my videos. But for the most part, you don't need to worry about this. If you simply just want to get it up and running, it will work on your CPU. Now we're going to create a volume, so this is going to create a Docker volume called Olama, and that's where it's going to store the large language models. Obviously, you'll be able to choose which large language model you want to use. We'll use DeepSeek for this video. But bear in mind, wherever you're going to store it, make sure you've got enough space. Some of these models do get pretty big. Now, after that, that's pretty much all we need to do. All I'm doing here is I've added an additional Olama network. That's because for the web UI, I'm going to put this behind a reverse proxy. All of this code will be available on my GitHub in the link in the description. And if you don't want to use a proxy, you can simply remove these sections here and uncomment these ports here. But having a quick look through the web UI, what we're gonna be doing here is pulling it down. We're gonna build this container using the build file that's there, this Docker file. It's gonna pull down the latest version it's going to also set up a volume which will store some of the configuration settings, i.e. login details. It's going to depend on Olama, so this won't start until the large language model is up and running. That makes sense. It's going to be able to connect to the large language model, and again, this just provides a front end. It can do that because it's on that same Docker network. And then we get onto the proxy settings, which, as I've mentioned before, are optional. Down here, we've got the two volumes it's going to create for the respective containers and also the two networks. Again, if you don't need the proxy network, you can simply remove that. I'll have all of the proxy settings commented out on my GitHub, and you can add them back in if you need to. So with all that up and running, let's get this container going. So to do that, we're going to hop over to the terminal. We're going to navigate to this folder, and hopefully we should just need to run the following command, sudo docker compose up dash d. It will then go away and pull those containers. How quickly will depend on your internet connection, but it should be pretty fast. Once that's done, you should be up and running. Now, if you're not using the reverse proxy like I am, you'll need to go to the IP address of this Docker host. So in my case here, you can see 200.50. But if I'm using a reverse proxy, I can simply go to this URL here once I've added that to my DNS resolver, in my case, Pi-hole. So that should be up and running in any moment, and then we'll be able to access the web interface. So all of that is now up and running. So I'm gonna load up my browser and hopefully we can access that page. So now with any luck, we should be able to hit return. If you get a 404, it might just be because it's doing some work in the background. Give it a few minutes and it should spin up. Hitting a refresh, you can see that we're now greeted with the first start page. So let's get started. For this, you're just going to need to create a local account. So put in whatever credentials you want, but obviously remember your password. Once you've created your credentials, you'll now be logged in and we're ready to get up and running. So it's pretty straightforward to get this started. By default, you don't have a model. So if you start doing something in here, say, tell me about space, it's not going to work because it doesn't have a model. Here you go. So how do we work? We can't just click select a model because we haven't actually downloaded any models. So to get this working, we can hit our name in the top right and we can click the admin panel. We can then go to the settings and then we want to click on models. Now on the models page, there's a little download button here for manage models. We want to click that and then we can choose what we want. So here you can see it's connected to Alarma on this port, which is the actual engine. Remember, this is the UI running on top. And then we need to have a look. So what we can do here is actually click on this button here and it will take us to the web page and you'll see all of the models that we can choose. Now, as I mentioned about the different parameters, 
The easiest one, the, the smallest one to use, is the 1.5b, 1.5 billion parameters. And it goes all the way up to 671 billion. Now, this and this one here, we're going to be deploying 7b. I think that gives you sort of a, a reasonable output. It's reasonably complex. But obviously, the more hardware you have, the more complex model you can run. If we actually click on the model itself, you'll see that the 7B image here weighs in about 4.7 gigs. And if we took it all the way up, you can see 671B is 404 gigabytes. So obviously pick something that is sensible for your setup. So I'm happy with 7B. So I'm going to go back to my admin panel. And in here, I'm going to put deepseek-r1 colon 7b now i should be able to just click the download button here that's now pulling the manifest you'll see that it start to download the model here obviously it will take some time dependent on what speed you've got of internet plus also when it pulls it down it then needs to verify all the hashes and checks and that could take some time as well once it's finished though it should populate in the background and show the model that we've got so now it says that the model has been successfully downloaded so we should be able to close this down and if we do a refresh on this page, you'll see now hopefully that, yeah, we've got that model here, which is great. So we're now in a position where we can actually make this work. So this time, if you say, tell me about space, the user interface will then be connecting in the background to the Alarma instance and running the model. And you can see now that it's spitting out the response that it thinks is reasonable. So the speed of this is known as sort of tokens per second more tokens per second, faster response, and you'll need to tame expectations in terms of what hardware you've got. So don't expect miracles on budget hardware, but if you have got deep pockets and you want to use some GPUs to accelerate this, go for it. I'll be testing GPU acceleration out on Windows at the end of this video. So now that has completed, we've got the response, and we can also click on the I here. So you can see that I was getting 15 tokens per second, which is basically sort of 15 words per second, which, isn't great, but it's not bad for a home setup, and this is all private running in a virtualized machine. So that gave us a good answer. Now, if we wanted to start a new chat, and you can obviously, it does remember previous conversations, but if you want to start a full new chat, you can just click the button at the top and then create a new chat. Let's now hop onto Windows. Let's get this up and running on the desktop with some GPU acceleration. Then we can see what the difference is between pure emulation on the CPU and the GPU. So heading over to the Alarma website, we simply need to click on Windows and click download. This is pretty straightforward and the same as pretty much any Windows installation. Once that has completed, you should see a little icon now in your task tray to say that Olama is up and running. Next, if we wanna just play around in the command line, we can actually just open up PowerShell. And if we type in Olama, we should get a response in terms of the flags for usage. Now here you can see we can serve, create, show, run, stop, pull, all of that sort of stuff. So the first thing we probably want to do is to pull a model. So to do that, we need to run the following command. So we should be able to do alarma pull, and then if we do deep seek dash r1 comma 7b and hit return, it can't find it, so it's now going away and pulling that down. Once that's downloaded, we should be in a position to use it to make commands. Now that that's downloaded, we can obviously do Alarma list and it should show. Great. And now hopefully what we can do is Alarma run and we can use that deep seek model. As it's already downloaded, that should now be able to quickly spin up and load this model. Again, this is going to depend on the hardware that you're using. I've got a NVMe drive in here, it's only PCIe Gen 3, and I've got a 2080 Ti. So now that's up and running, let's see how quickly we can get a response. One thing you might want to do if you want to see tokens per second is actually rerun that command and put in verbose. Now when we run it, it should spit out the tokens for seconds. So let's do tell me about space. Here you can see that that is significantly faster. And if you pull this up here, you can see that it was hitting my GPU at about 80%. So what did we get there? Around sort of 60 tokens per second, I think, if I'm reading that right, um, which is significantly faster than what we had before. Now, if you wanted to, before we had that nice friendly user interface with the Llama web UI, if you actually look in the variables for that Docker container, if we go back here, you can see that the Olama base URL here is set to this machine up here. 
Now on my Windows machine, I could change this to be the Windows machine. I'll have to open up the Windows firewall, etc. But as long as they're on the same subnet, you shouldn't need any funky firewall rules. We could then plug in the open UI into this Windows machine and then have the benefit of that nice UI with that GPU acceleration. So in my case, I'd change this URL here to the PC I'm recording on. But if you want an even easier way of doing this, you might want to head over and download Docker Desktop for Windows. You can find that link over here, and if we click this button and download it, once that's downloaded, we should simply need to install it. And we basically need to run the same command or same Docker Compose file that we did before. So with those defaults accepted, it should go ahead and install. And within a few seconds, we should be into the Docker desktop environment. For this to work, you might need to have virtualization turned on on your motherboard settings. So make sure you have things like Intel dash V, etc. Now that it's installed, we're going to have to reboot our machine. So let's do that and I'll see you on the other side. So having restarted, let's accept the service agreement. And we're now presented with the Docker desktop. So working our way through the installation process, we should be able to just skip this, skip the next step, and we're ready to get up and running. So once we're in here, we should be able to click on the terminal. We want to enable that terminal, and we should be able to paste in the following command. And that command was simply to do the Docker run for the compose file we already had. So if we scroll up, we can see here it was Docker run. We're gonna do it on port 3000. Many of these settings are the same as what we had in the Docker Compose. Once that's completed, it should connect to the local host, to that Alarma instance that's already running. And hopefully if we access local host on port 3000, we should be greeted with the same Alarma web UI. But we now have it local and we also have that GPU acceleration, which should help a ton. So this should pop up and we want to allow that so we can access it on that local host. And here you can see that we've got the open web UI now in the containers and fingers crossed if we click this here, it should open up in a browser and we should be able to access it. Now it can take again a couple of refreshes just to get this working. That's just because it's pulling down some stuff and configuring it. So again, you'll need to create a new account because it's local. When you've created it and logged in, you'll get exactly the same interface. Let's go. And fingers crossed, yeah, you can see that we've already here got the model selected. So now if I ask it a question, tell me how deep seek works. We should see the GPU heating up. Yep, we can see here now that it's using 30 to 40% of my GPU. And yeah, when it's actually printing out those tokens and it's going for it, over 80% GPU usage. And you can see the speed at which this is working compared to the previous installation. And if we have another look again, we can see here that we've got sort of 50 tokens per second, which is pretty good for a local host and quite an old now GPU. So thanks for watching everybody. Hopefully now you've got everything you need to go and explore DeepSeek and find out why it's disrupting the AI marketplace. We've demonstrated in this video that we can run it. It's open source and it runs pretty well on average hardware. Let me know your experiences with DeepSeek, what you're gonna be using it for and why. And again, if you're gonna be plugging this into open hands, let me know how you're getting on with coding using DeepSeek. I might cover that in a future video. But for now, I'm gonna wrap this video. Remember all my codes available on GitHub in the description below. Thanks for watching. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody.